Hi, Pastor Jeannie here along with... Pastor Stephen. Welcome and so excited to have you join us as... Pastor Stephen, how was your Christmas? Oh, it was great. This was our first Christmas living in St. Louis. We had been living in Kansas City for quite a while and this was our first Christmas waking up in St. Louis with St. Louis family nearby and it was just fantastic. Like just, I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Oh, yay. That yeah. is super exciting. And how about you? Yeah, well, we went to Indiana and had a super blast there with the family and just being able to, to connect. It's always fun coming back and your car is super packed full of um, all kinds of presents and making room for it. Yeah, that's always nice. And you just have to uh, hold it in your lap. Kind yeah, of thing, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely it like this. Well, anyway, we are so glad that you are here and that you have joined us today as we prepare our hearts for worship. Will you join us? Hello. Welcome to Church of the Shepherd. My name is Brad, and today I'm joined with Camille. We're happy just to be in worship with you today, wherever you are singing uh, or worshiping. Just, just join us and sing together as we worship. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God never fails. He will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. It's in the waiting. The same God is never late. Working all things out. Working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. It's in the waiting. The same God is never late. To working all things out. To working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you up in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes. I will not choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand, I choose, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will lift you up in the lowest valley. I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will.
The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, and breathe, call these bones to live, and call these lungs to sing once again. I will pray, Jesus, Jesus, and you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, yes you do, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence bear, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, oh Jesus. Jesus, I call on your name, Jesus, Jesus. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny, and your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a lie forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you silence me, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, oh. We hope you've had a wonderful Christmas season. This is our opportunity to continue to worship God in all these different ways, whether singing Christmas songs to being able to focus on what's God saying right now at this particular point of the year. At the end of one year, looking to the next, in a few moments we'll be able to get a little bit deeper into that. I do want to invite you to let us know that you're here. Text us at the numbers on the screen. Um, say that you're here. If you're new for the first time, say new. If not, say the word regular. 
If you want to give to be part of the church um, offering, uh, you can do that by uh, sending out uh, a check in the mail if you want to do it that way. You can also click on the link on our website or the app. And it doesn't matter how you do it, just remember why you do it, that God is good, and this is just a way of responding to God's goodness to the act of offering. I invite you to join with me for a time of prayer. God, still our hearts, focus our attention. Reveal something new. When we worship, we are putting our attention on you. So whatever distraction we have that's happening right now, we, we quiet it. We push it aside so that we can give this time more fully to you in order to give our hearts more fully to you. Open our hearts for what comes next. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Today is December 26th. It's the end of the year, and we have all this opportunity now to reflect over 2021 and see what it was and what it wasn't. We have a chance to celebrate the best parts and also look back at the parts that uh, bring other kind of feelings with it too. Uh, 2021 uh, is, is nearly over and you have all these lists that pop up including uh, the word of the year list and 2021 the word of the year is vaccine according to the Webster's Dictionary. You have uh, time person of the year which was Elon Musk. Uh, you have uh, the song of the year which is the Taylor Swift uh, song All Too Well uh, which is a reminder for everybody again to be very very careful when you uh, date Taylor Swift, make sure you treat her well. Because if you don't, there'll be a song made out of you. Uh, we also know that this is the time of the year where we look back on the people who we have lost during the last 12 months, uh, both celebrities like Hank Aaron um, and Colin Powell, to, to people within our own homes, our own extended families, communities. We also want to pay attention to the fact that just recently uh, we announced that there is the 800,000th person has passed away for COVID. 800,000 people now. And all of this requires us to, to pause and to reflect, and that's okay to do. And in fact, this is the part of the year where reflecting is uniquely appropriate. Because when you reflect at the end of the year, you really are reflecting in this hinge time between what has already taken place and, and what you're looking forward to. So we're in this hinge moment of, of both looking back and looking forward. And, and for the Methodist Church, we have this one particular Sunday that's based upon our tradition that helps us do both things. John Wesley started the Methodist Church. He wasn't trying to start a new denomination, but, but his actions, his leadership led to this denomination. And what he found was that this is the time of the year where people are looking back and looking forward. So he created a pamphlet where we talked about covenant. And covenant is the most important theme of the Bible that no one talks about. It is, in fact, some people would say it's the key theme of the Bible, the covenant between God and God's people. It is a relationship between God revealed to a certain group of folks. Covenant is this big theme, and what John Wesley thought was that this is the time of the year that we should all be reflecting on the idea of covenant. Covenant refers to a different kind of uh, arrangement between two people than, than other kinds of arrangements. We might be more familiar with contracts. And the contract is all about the rules of, of what each person is supposed to do, but a covenant, the focus is on the relationship, not on the rules. A covenant is about two parties agreeing to be a certain kind of person to the other. There's this interesting scripture in Genesis 15. It's really odd. It's really crazy. You can look it up yourself. But there's this moment where Abraham falls asleep. And, and when he does, he has seen that these two piles of animals have been cut in half. And there's a torch that passes through both of those piles of animals. I read it. I skipped over it. I thought it was weird, but I just kept on reading. Um, you probably read it and skipped over it too. You know, we have that in common. But what I learned was that that was actually part of a covenant ceremony. Uh, back then, what they would do, one side would say, I'll trade you these five goats for those two acres of land. And somebody would say, all right, I'll trade you two acres of land for your five goats. Uh, full disclosure, I don't know what the goats to land um, trade was back then, but it feels about right. And what they would do, they would take some animals, they would cut them in half, and the blood would go between the two piles of, of animals into the middle. And each person would say, my five for your two, my two for your five. And they would walk through with their feet touching the blood of the animals. And it was a way of saying that if I fail my end of the covenant, let it be to my blood as it was to these animals. And the other person did the same thing. 
So when uh, the scripture is uh, showing us about Abraham falling asleep, two piles and, and a torch passing through, the readers at that time would have understood that it was God saying that if I fail, God, I, God, fail, my end of the bargain, let it be to my blood as it was to you. But if you fail your end of the bargain, let it also be upon me and my blood. What God was saying in that moment was that the covenant was a relationship between God and God's self, but God was willing to hold on to the covenant even when Abraham and his descendants and you and I didn't uphold our end of the covenant. When we misbehave, when we act out, God doesn't say, well, that's my excuse to back away. God says, I'm staying with it. Covenant um, it comes from this language. The, the covenant um, word in the Old Testament means uh, barit. The word barit that we understand as covenant literally means to cut, as in to cut a deal. It comes from this idea. What we understand is that God is interested in relationships and covenant, and we have a chance as we look back on the last year and look forward to the next to ask, what is the nature of our relationship with God right now? What is God wanting to happen to be put back in right relationship? In John 1, we have this Christmas scripture, and this Christmas scripture is going to help us out it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And as we're looking back and looking forward, I think these are the two words that are going to help us the most. Jesus was full of grace. Grace is an unearned love. There's nothing that came before it. Grace is what happens after we've burned all the bridges. Grace is the force that drove Jesus to, to forgive the woman caught in adultery and all uh, the men who are part uh, of the stoning as well. Grace is what drove Jesus to forgive Zacchaeus, who had chosen money over friends, and said, I want to eat with you at your house and be your friend. Uh, grace forgave the thief on the cross with the words, Today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, grace is what we hear right now too. We're used to earned love, and yet grace surprises us and says, Even when you don't deserve it, I'll bring it. Jesus is full of grace, and that's a very good thing. But the other part of the sentence is he's full of both grace and truth. Truth is a little bit more uncomfortable. There's a young adult a book and movie came out called Divergent, and there's a faction of the people uh, within that story who are part of the faction called Candor. And those are people who just go around, they just tell people of the truth, sometimes without any sugar coating, without any kind of uh, tact involved. Yeah, sometimes we are that way, right? Sometimes we just give people blunt truth, and sometimes we know people who give us blunt truth. Jesus uh, is, is both truth and grace. So if we understand there's truth involved, but he would sprinkle uh, some grace when it happens. See, truth-telling is going to be important. And we have very few relationships that can be described as being a truth-telling relationship. You might have a, a truth-telling relationship with your doctor. Your doctor uh, might see you for a checkup and say, well, your cholesterol is up and you know, you've gained some weight since we last saw each other. And you're like, oh, thank you, doctor. Uh, how much do I owe you for your truth-telling? Do we, do we pay you directly here? Do we pay you know, your assistant at the counter? You might have uh, a receptionist uh, who is also a truth-teller, who, who tells you your bill is overdue. A pastor friend of mine uh, shared how she has a son, about eight years old, who uh, commented just recently and said, Mom, you have a lot more gray hair. You're getting old. And that's some truth-telling moments, right? And maybe you have people in your life, um, in addition to a doctor or a child, who uh, are able to be a truth teller for you. When we say that Jesus is full of truth, we're saying that he is willing to tell us the things that we need to know. He's willing to be known. And it's the truth of Jesus. It's that truth that is inside of him that propelled him to tell religious hypocrites who they were. And to say, you're off. You're screwing up. It's that truth that took Jesus into the temple and, and kicked out a big group of folks because the temple of God that was supposed to be for helping the poor and those in need was actually being used to uh, distort the law to make the poor even poorer. And Jesus was full of truth and says, that's got to stop too. 
We have this picture of Jesus uh, as a God of grace, but if we forget that he's a God of truth, he's more of a teddy bear. You just want to hug Jesus, and you forget that Jesus is not just a huggable Jesus. He's a, a Jesus that has words to say that are not going to hit our hearts well. You know, we have a lot of relationships with people who, who just tell us what we like to hear. We might have a yes man, a less, yes woman. But we all need somebody who's going to tell us that we have mustard on our shirt. We all need somebody who's going to tell us that we have something stuck in our teeth. And we need somebody who's going to do that for us on a spiritual level too. Recognizing that Jesus is full of truth protects us from having a relationship with Jesus that is just buddy-buddy and forgets the fact he's also the Messiah. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Our main story today uh, comes from the end of the Jewish people's time in the wilderness. They've been walking around for 40 years. And they're getting ready to, to enter into the Holy Land. But before that, there's a moment where they renew their covenant. And here's a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses says, Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, Who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we can obey it? In other words, this is, these are not new ideas. They're not ideas you have to work for and, and stretch to even understand. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart so you may obey it. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love your Lord. Listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him. Why is God talking about blessings and curses? Is God planning on cursing you? No. God knows about blessings and curses because He's He's been around uh, and so you see a thing or two. He knows what happens. And when you follow God's commandments, there's something about the obedience to God that takes us down a path that is better for us. And He knows if you follow that path, there's blessings that come down the way. And He also knows there's ways that we hear God's voice and we don't obey it and we go this direction. And that direction has certain consequences of behavior that are harmful to us. He's not punishing us to, if we go down that way. That path has consequences behind it. You know, God is telling them, you have these choices to make. Those are truthful comments, two choices to make. And the grace is that God is willing to offer a, a new chance. Because for 40 years, there's been ups and downs of obedience. The whole golden calf is part of the story. But God's given a second chance. Just as John Wesley had Methodist Christians renew covenant at the end of each late November, at the end of each late December. Just as Moses knew that before they went into the new land was the perfect time to renew a covenant. Today is the perfect time for you to renew your covenant too. Jesus is always going to be perfectly in balance. He's going to tell you about your spiritual situation. He's going to tell you not just about the mustard on your shirt, the stuff stuck in your teeth. He's going to talk to us about our sin. He's going to point it out, not because he's evil, but because he's truthful. And for me, I think about these conversations. I imagine Jesus with a flashlight going around my heart, pointing out things and saying, do you see that there? And do you see that over there? And it's not comfortable. And it's not a conversation that I look forward to all the time. But Jesus loves me enough to tell me the truth. He loves you enough to tell you the truth as well. Because Jesus is a God of grace, it helps the truth go down a little bit differently. Because He's God of grace, also we don't think of God as this ultimate like wrist slapper who's just trying to make us feel the pain of what we've done. But God of truth and grace comes together and says this whole conversation is for our benefit, for the benefit of the world. Jesus says, here, look here, are you aware of this? And when he, he points it out, we see it and we name it before Jesus. And he says, now give it to me. 
You've seen it. I've seen it. Now give it to me. Let me forgive it. And let's do something else instead. All of us have sinned and are in need of forgiveness. And all of us have access to God giving us grace as a Savior. We can become right with God right now. It's not a very far away thing to ask. In fact, it's very, very near. It is in our mouth and our hearts so that we might follow it. One of my favorite songs at Christmas time is from John Lennon. Uh, it's perfect for today. He says, so this is Christmas, and what have you done? Another year older, a new one has just begun. And whenever I hear that song, I just get really nostalgic. I look back on the last year, and I think forward to the, to the next year. And I think that's helpful for us right now, too. Look back. Look back over the last 12 months. Call to mind the areas where you stepped away from God where God was the one taking care of the covenant all by himself and just name them. Maybe even talk about the other times this last year when you've had other covenants, marriage, your parenting, your friendship, other relationships where you have pulled back and the other person was the one who held the relationship together for the two of you. And name it. It might even be really healing for you to even tell the other person that you realize that they're the one holding the relationship together for this last little bit of time. Name and confess to God and say, God, this is what I'm seeing in my heart when I am truthful with what's inside. Name it. And then also name the different ways that we have sinned, not by doing something wrong, but we have sinned by withholding something good. But there are people who needed help over the last 12 months and we couldn't be bothered. We were too busy or a number of other excuses. Whatever, whatever yours was, it may have been different than mine, but we all have them. And say, God, I look back on the last year, I've seen how I treated people. I want that to stop too. A new year is about to start. We have 365 days to treat as currency. May we spend them following Jesus Christ, renewing the relationship and having a brand new lease of life, saying this year, 2022, will be marked by my increased discipleship to Jesus Christ, the God who's full of both truth and grace. When a couple uh, decide to renew their wedding vows, they, they get dressed up and they go back to these certain words, these, these very important words, and they recount them. And we're going to do the same. You don't have to be dressed up for this. Pajamas and jeans are going to work out just fine. But John Wesley created this Wesley Covenant prayer. And I'm going to lead this, and I invite you to lead this as well. Um, pray it as a way to renew your covenant with God. Let's pray. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified, signed in heaven. Amen. We're glad that you're joining us for this post-conversation where we get a chance to talk more about this idea of covenant renewal and this picture of Jesus. And I'm going to ask uh, Gina, you've already heard from me, for Pastor Gina to share with us, when you hear the language of Jesus being full of, of truth and grace, uh, what does that mean for you? Uh, what does truth mean to you and what does grace mean to you in that relationship? Uh, God's, God's grace 
just is something, it's an experience, it's an, a gift that comes to you. And, and explaining it to all different, uh, to the kids, uh, to adults too, because it, it's something that is so hard to imagine, right? Receiving a gift for something that I haven't done, this acceptance, this forgiveness, and what exactly that truly means. Um, uh, but, but if you can just imagine though, that you are receiving this beautiful gift that's set upon your porch, and you go and you open up your front door and you see this and it's exactly what you wanted it's exactly what you have been hoping for the answer and you've done nothing really to deserve it and you don't really know exactly where it came from but but we know where all of our gifts and the blessings that they come from god because god because god is love so being able to extend this kind of grace to surprise those around us and to be able to share this um, just this love this unconditional love that can be unwrapped within our relationships and our conversations and just supporting and caring of one another and how does that differ from god's truth um, and god's truth you know i just go to his word and i just try to remind myself and what his word says to me and when i'm filled with so much of of the noise that's around me and what i see on the news and how i should be or doing this or, or doing that that god's truth just kind of causes me to pause and to think and to quiet and to quiet my thoughts onto the simplest thing which is love and god's love and so in seeing the world around me through this this lens of God's truth just helps helps me to um, to stay grounded that I can lean into it doesn't change like everything else from day to day and that I can fall and that I can trust in that so um, so those are kind of my grace grace and truth mm -hmm. I, I think it's helpful to know that they don't have to be in opposition to each other but they're both aspects of God that can complement each other, um, just like you just said. And, uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about grace and truth with us. Uh, we invite you to be part of uh, what's happening next in the life of this church. Uh, we are starting a new series next week called Relation Slips. It's talking about the ways we can handle all of our oops with grace and different ways that, that might impact our, our boundaries, uh, how we have forgiveness, how we handle conflict, um, how we upset some um, family cycles and generational problems. Um, and next week, the conversation, Pastor John Scalidison is going to talk about words, how our words can either reflect uh, love or do the opposite. So if you're struggling with how you handle your words, putting the foot and mouth kind of disease that exists, uh, join us next week as we talk more about that. Thank you so much and Happy New Year.